Dr. Rami Hashish. Dr. Rami has consulted for various organizations, including pro sports teams in the NBA and NFL. He does a lot of national media tours. He's appeared on the Discovery Channel, a expert witness on more than a thousand occasions examining injuries in sports. I mean, the guy is really well tapped in, very charismatic. What's going on with the king and is he going to be okay? Subjects he is prepared to discuss on your show. How is Tom Brady still crushing it on the football field at age 43? Can these shoes really make your butt bigger? Well, that's not completely true. Can the vaccine negatively affect athletic performance? So I have no interest in being a biomechanical expert, but I would love to know the answers to the shoe question at least and everything else. Dr. Hashish has two doctoral degrees, one in physical therapy and one in biomechanics. And get this, the dude is super good looking. Are you sensing a tinge of jealousy? Well, you should be because it's more than a tinge. I am extremely jealous of this man. Get ready for a great conversation with Dr. Rami Hashish, founder of the National Biomechanics Institute. Dr. Ashish, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. This is a cool conversation that we get to have because we've had 390 episodes of this show and I've covered lots of different facets of the sports industry, but I haven't talked to anybody with your background. So I'm really excited to dive into some of these topics. Thanks for joining me. Of course. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's get into your background a little bit first. Uh, there are a lot of great topical questions we want to jump into. A lot of things happening right now or just important issues, but let's learn about you first. Two doctoral degrees, one in physical therapy, one in biomechanics. That's pretty impressive right there. That's quite a commitment to your craft. When and why did you figure out that this was the path that you wanted to go down? How did you know that this was what you wanted for your career journey? So yeah, that's that's it. It's a journey. So initially, I knew I wanted to go down it when in high school was the first indication. So I was trying to get a scholarship in football. And before my senior year, I sustained a pretty bad ankle injury, uh, actually jumping on a trampoline, of all things. And, <laughs> That's why I yeah. refuse to have one for my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, they are injurious kinds of kinds of things. Kind of death trap. trap. Sorry, death go ahead. <laughs> death traps. So it's yeah. a pretty bad injury. And it I, I had to go through rehab and through physical therapy. And and at that time, this was a handful of years ago, uh, almost about 20 years ago now. So when I was going through it, the rehab is not where it was now. It's kind of archaic. And accordingly, I didn't recover, recover too well. It was very slow. Uh, and it delayed my progress into the season. And I didn't perform all, all too great. So it was actually really at that point where I kind of realized an opportunity was kind of turning, uh, it was really a blessing in disguise, turning something bad into good, where I didn't recover well, and it kind of affected my season and it affected, you know, my sports performance. But it also was kind of this realization that, hey, this is an opportunity for me. I'm interested in the intersection between sports and technology and rehab and medicine. So I kind of realized that I wanted to jump into this field and to physical therapy for the purpose of kind of being at the forefront of it. I, I saw that there was a lot of opportunities for advancements and change, and I want to be kind of at the forefront of, of that. So that's what ultimately led to my pursuit of, of physical therapy, at least. I think it's it's so funny. I'm sitting here smiling as you're talking because I had a very similar experience. I, uh, I was a competitive soccer player, and in high school, I wanted to go on and play D1 soccer, and I blew out my knee. Uh, tore my PCL, tore t just t tore the whole thing to shreds. And I went through lots of physical therapy. And I had the same experience where I was like, I think this is kind of cool. Maybe this is the way I continue being involved in in the sports field. And then my, after my freshman year of college, I realized I wasn't smart enough. So congratulations <laughs> to you for, for following through. That's pretty cool. So what what made you go the biomechanics side afterwards? I mean, two doctorates. My goodness. Yeah. So so. I was started to treat patients and I was actually working on, at some clinics and I was doing my rotations and I ended up working at this clinic in, in Chicago where it dealt with really high end athletes, high end uh, runners and marathoners. And they would come in with these overuse injuries pretty consistently. Uh, and it, you know, in evaluating how they run and how they move, it at least was a realization to me and also some of the other physical therapists in the clinic that one of kind of the things that was leading to their injuries was improper footwear. So okay. it was another kind of uh, uh, moment where I realized, hey, here's an opportunity. 
And I kind of came to the realization that I didn't want to just treat patients. I wanted to prevent the problem from even starting. So I wanted to understand how the problem started. So if, as a physical therapist, I developed the skills to treat patients, have an understanding of how they get injured and how to treat them. But I didn't really learn as to how to completely prevent injuries and how do I actually have a better understanding intimately with injury so that we can develop solutions to help prevent injury. So I decided to pursue my PhD. And specifically, I did my PhD in biomechanics with an emphasis on the influence of footwear on injury and performance. And I specialized in running based upon kind of what I was doing there. So one thing led to another, and that's that's ultimately how, how I came to uh, pursue my PhD. Is that a rarity in the field to have that kind of a combination? Because it sounds, the way you explain it, it sounds very logical. You know, the recovery, but then understanding preventatively why things are happening. That makes total sense. But are you an anomaly in, in your industry or is this kind of a, a trend that a lot of people follow? Uh, well, <laughs> not, not mo most people don't want to go to school for that long. So I guess, I'm <laughs> a, you know, so I guess I'm an anomaly for that, for willing to spend 12 years of Congratulations. my life. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Spending 12 years of my life doing education is obviously, you know, not, not the norm, uh, particularly in a, in a field and in an industry that's kind of more. Uh, developing. But mm -hmm. with regards to the people who actually pursue their PhD in biomechanics, traditionally, they either come in one of two routes. They either come from a background of engineering, or they have a master's of, for instance, mechanical engineering or, or what have you, or they have some sort of clinical background where they have a medical degree, an MD, a DPT, or something along those lines, or, or an athletic trainer. And then they, they supplement what they don't have. So the engineers would do a little bit of medicine or some anatomy, in the pursuit of their PhD in biomechanics or the medical doctors or the physical therapists such as myself do a lot more engineering to have a better kind of more cohesive uh, background between the engineering and fusing it with medicine. It's super interesting. I know we have a lot of kinesiology majors in our audience. If somebody was pursuing that, interested in it like you were, but they're maybe not ready to go get their doctorate, multiple doctorates in your case, what are the kind of opportunities out there? Is this a field that's continually on a, on a growth cycle and that there's a high demand for? And what do those kind of opportunities look like? Well, first of all, it's it's insane how many opportunities are available now that weren't available 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I started going down this path. So it, it's a growing industry. So the first thing I would tell somebody is that don't worry, you're going to find a job. There's so many jobs that will that will be available. And there are more and more that are developing as, as time goes on. So as far as opportunities that are available, they are uh, across the board based upon what the interest that you have lies in. So for instance, you can go work for a sports team or a college program or a college athletic program. Um, you can go work for research institutions. Uh, some are well known, some are not. Or you could even go work directly in industry. So uh, whether that's Nike or Adidas or Fitbit or Apple or yeah. what have you, if we look at all these kind of smart wearable devices or or we look at any sort of sports product we use, back in the day that may have not necessarily been uh, – they may have not necessarily had kinesiologists or been driven as by science as much as they are now. But right now they have teams of scientists that are really driving the technology and driving the approaches. So somebody with a kinesiology background fits perfectly into those positions. It makes sense. We talk a lot of times for our side of the industry that we've all become a lot more data driven. You know, we make data driven decision making models, which like most other businesses have done for a long time, but in the sports industry, somewhat a little bit behind the times, whether it's in sales or in marketing, so many more decisions are based around data. And it makes sense that on the footwear side or on the apparel side, or on the wearable side, that they're going and using the science a little more than ever. So there's, there's great opportunities there. So you've started to build up quite a personal brand. Congratulations. You've got your weekly web show. You've had a lot of media appearances. You've been asked for commentaries on you know, everything from Tiger Woods' uh, car crash and what this means for, for him in a physical standpoint. Um, 
you're quite the media darling. Congratulations. <laughs> One thing I noticed, <laughs> you got the look, you got the whole thing going, you're fine. Um, one thing I noticed was that you make a lot of these daunting subjects very approachable, meaning I saw one of your videos where you asked the question, can certain shoes make your butt bigger? And I just think that makes it really approachable. How important is that to bring your personality and your charisma to some of these highly scientific issues to make, to kind of open it up for everybody to enjoy and be a part of? Uh, I consider it 50% of the 50% of the whole deal, right? So there's 50% of actually knowing the science and understanding it. But if you don't have the ability to actually help people understand what that means, then it's purposeless, right? So, you know, that's something that I pride myself on, but it's also something that even educationally, they, they really stressed, uh, you know, I did my PhD at USC and they really stressed the ability to communicate your thoughts and the ability to communicate your thoughts to, uh, somebody who may not understand them. Something that we would always say is if you can't explain what you know to an eight year old, then you don't know it. Right. If you can't explain it easily, then you don't know it well enough. Right. So the goal really is you know, you take this complex subject matter, whatever it is, and you have to be able to explain it to your kid. And if you're able to do that, then you know it well, and everybody will understand it well. But if you can't, that's not only an indication that you don't know it, but that's also an indication that they won't look, understand it at, at all. So it's it's imperative. It's 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 definitely at least at least fifty percent, or not more, of what we do. I do think that's part of what opens it up for so many more people to be involved and knowledgeable about it. And then it just, it grows the field. It grows the importance and the credibility of the field when everybody's engaging in this way. Um, most importantly, can shoes make your butt bigger? <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are shoes that can definitely tone, help tone your butt. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's these, there's these shoes that came out of Canada, I believe they're called Maasai uh, Maasai barefoot technology or MBTs and the sketcher okay. shape ups, you know, the, the sketcher shape yeah, ups that yeah, yeah. the shoes that had kind of the, the kind of curved bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So those shoes it works. Do they work? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love putting you on the spot. It's great. <laughs> I'll tell you the original shoes work. So those MBT shoes work, the sketcher yeah. shoes that they were called into question. Right. So, yeah. I think uh, Kim Kardashian had some advertisements with the, with there the you go, oh, yeah, yeah, back in the day. Uh, <laughs> I think that you know they were one of the reasons as to uh, reclaim the fame. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, I, the, I hate to sound like the old guy in the conversation, but I remember I was living in Colorado for a while, and it seemed like every runner for like a two or three year period had the barefoot, like the toe, the toe running shoes. And then mm -hmm. it seemed like that fad kind of came and went too. Was that kind of a crazy moment or was that legit? The, the, you know what I'm talking about? The like the almost barefoot running shoes yeah. with like actual individual toe holes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are called- Was that a fad or was that legit? Uh, the part of it is a fad and part of it is legit. So, I mean, there, I guess like if you look at anything, there's part of it, there's truth. And then sometimes the truth is extended and it kind of results in, and not the best result. So, you know, th the backstory behind that is actually a pretty cool one. So there's this, uh, sprinter from Ethiopia back in the day, his name was at BBB Kila and okay. he, uh, went and I think he won the marathon and the Olympics, if I'm not mistaken, and he did it barefoot. If I'm not mistaken, I, I made wow. that story story off. Um, they basically it's didn't a have good story. We're sticking with it. <laughs> yeah. They didn't have the the. He, I think they were sponsored by Adidas, and they didn't have uh, shoes in his size, so he ended up having to run. But the deal with him and a lot with a lot of these other runners um, from some of these African nations or some of these kind of indigenous tribes, for instance, in Mexico, is that they would regularly train barefoot. So yeah. when they would train barefoot, they found out that these athletes were not only fast, but they also were really efficient with their energy. They weren't using their, their endurance was, was really good. They weren't sustaining a lot of these overuse injuries. And the idea was that they were training barefoot. They were met, they were able to run in this barefoot pattern, which was basically a pattern that was characterized by landing on your toes as opposed to landing on your heels. Whereas us, when we run in shoes, traditionally in the West, we have this big, very thick heel and we end up run, yeah. landing on our heels. And we have these overuse injuries in our knee where these 
barefoot runners wouldn't really have these overuse injuries. So the thought was, hey, if we run in these barefoot shoes, yeah. we're going to be amazing just like they are. But turns out yeah. that's not how not it, quite. It's, it's not, not not quite. We still we may wear the barefoot shoes, but we're still landing on our heels, and we end up having some pretty bad injuries in our lower leg and stress fractures and all of these problems. Yeah. So the fad of it was, yeah, you know, some people who know how to run that way, it's really helpful. The problem is we don't know how to run that way and it takes a while to learn how to run that way. Yeah, it's a skill. It's a, it's not always just the equipment, it's the technique and everything exactly. else that goes into it. Yeah. So let's dive into some fun topics. I had a, uh, there was a research thing I read, I don't know, it was probably 10 years ago, who knows how long ago it was, but it interviewed, they interviewed a thousand um, like people in their 90s and they asked them, what are what are two what are the main things you wish looking back you could have done, done differently in your life and the overwhelming answers were i wish i would have written down more of what i did day to day and i wish i would have stretched more daily and that has stuck with me for some reason like okay i'm in my 40s i have to be you know stretching more and doing this cuz all these people look back and say i should have done that more <laughs> Is, are they right does does having a daily stretching routine lead to more comfort and flexibility later in life is are these important steps or is this just kind of one of those myths that gets propelled throughout the well long term stretching is helpful right but uh, the, there is a myth with stretching and the myth is that stretching before an event or stretching before an exercise reduces injury or stretching that that's a myth that that doesn't actually help stretching before an exercise really? yeah that's stretching cool. before, okay, keep going stretching, yeah stretching before an exercise you know doesn't particularly static stretching doesn't really do much for us it actually if anything, it actually may hinder our performance. So for instance, if you do some sort of static stretching before jumping, it actually has shown that the stretching may actually result in reduced jump performance. So that is that concept is a myth of just like the effect, the, the short-term effect of stretching. What is not a myth, however, is the long-term effect of stretching. So stretching consistently, uh, long-term, every day, with dynamic stretching and static stretching, depending on kind of the activities that you're doing, that is helpful and it certainly helps kind of, you know, the pliability of, of our body and, and, and all of those things. And that's very helpful. I think that's fascinating because you do. I mean, I've been an athlete all my life and you always think of like, okay, got to cool down and stretch. I got to warm up and stretch. I got to stretch, stretch, stretch. But unless you're doing it consistently over a long period of time, it's not just like, before performance, like it has to be more of a, a longer term mindset. Is that kind of what we're getting at? Yeah, it has to be a longer term mindset and it has to be, it has to be very consistent. Uh, also, it has to keep in mind what your goals are, right? So yeah. for instance, static stretching where, you know, we just bend down and touch our toes and hold that position yeah. isn't particularly effective uh, in really getting longer or better hamstring uh, yeah. flexibility. It has to be, traditionally, it's more effective if we're doing dynamic, consistent stretching. The static stretching is usually only beneficial for people who have to hold static postures for a long period of time. Okay. Right? So if you have to hold some sort of posture, let's say you're, I don't know, a certain style of gymnast and you're doing static stretching to hold that particular posture, that's yeah. helpful. But for that, for the rest of us, who just want to have good health long term, then the idea is uh, you want to do more dynamic stretching and we want to do it consistently. But before doing an exercise, you, no, you know, doing stretching is not necessarily going to help us perform better or, or help prevent us get injured. Okay. No, that's good to know. And you're, you're the expert, so I'm trusting it. Um, so you say the word pliability. And I think Tom Brady. So we've heard Tom Brady talk about his TB12 program for years ad nauseum. And I ask you, how much do you believe? And I know, I know you're not training him. You're not with him. I'm not, I'm not asking you to do like declaring anything per se, but how much do you believe that his process of gaining more pliability, his nutrition, his diet has contributed to his long-term success versus him just being an abnormal human and being able to do things other people can't. Like what, where is that, that line? Like if I start doing TB12, am, am I going to be reaping those benefits or is it kind of like, yeah, well, yeah, he's special. I mean, let's just put him in a different category. Well, yeah, he, he is special, but 
you know, what he's doing can be understated. I mean, what he's doing is helpful clearly to him. So, but he's saying it's a program, right? So that's the yeah. key component. It's not just one singular thing that he's doing that's leading to all of his success. It's it's a whole gamut of things. And I'm sure he's taking a very holistic approach. And I know the nutrition that he's focusing on really emphasizes kind of limiting inflammation and, and doing different things that are or that will ultimately help his his overall performance. So if you're going to do the TB12 approach, will it help you? I mean, theoretically, yes. I mean, all of it is is founded in science. But I think the key po- key component is, and the key thought is, is that one regime and one program doesn't necessarily fit for everyone, right? So we know that nutrition, we have a better understanding, for instance, of nutrition over the last 15 to 20 years, that nutrition has to be specific based upon various factors, food sensitivities, blood type, genetic makeup, what have you. And same thing with different sorts of exercise that we're doing. That has to be this very specific approach, but it also has to be a very holistic approach. So, um, you know, to, to simplify that, yeah, I mean, He's not, it's not just that he's special. He's also putting in the work. Yeah. You have to respect that. I mean, he's putting in so much work and putting in such a dedicated approach to all of it, like respect to the guy for sure. But do you think this sets a new standard? Like I remember coming up when I came up and like guys like Joe Montana, guys like John Elway, guys like, I mean, uh, all kinds of athletes across all sports. By the time they hit 36, 37, they were pretty much done. But now we're seeing that bar is changing. Do you think that the science meshed with the player focus, like th- there's just going to be continually new bars set as far as players and how long they can last in their sport? Absolutely. Yes. And that's kind of one of the most fun, fun things about kind of the, the field that I'm in is that we see how people are able to actually push their limit and how we're utilizing science to realize what are the best methods to push their fountain of youth or extend their fountain of youth, so to speak. We kind of actually see it on both sides or both ends of the spectrum. If you look at it, we see some of these older athletes or older individuals are able to extend uh, how long that they can play. But we also see these younger athletes are able to achieve excellence at younger ages. I think if I'm not mistaken, somebody just yesterday uh, won gold at the Olympics, I think at 13 or 14, right? So we're kind of crazy, right? Yeah, it's insane. So, but we're really seeing it on both ends of the spectrum is that we have this more highly specialized understanding as to what makes athletes excellent, so to speak, right? In the very simplistic terms. And we see it at the low end, uh, the, the younger ages and the higher ages. And people are adapting and athletes are adapting to really achieve excellence at these kind of ends of the spectrum. So I think we're going to continuously see that. I, that's got to be so exciting for somebody like you that really attacks the science side of this is to just know the unlimited potential of people and what you're able to tap into. That has to be pretty exciting. Yeah, it's super exciting. You know, we, we see that. And what we're also seeing is how athletes can recover from injury, something that may have been career sports career threatening or sports career ending yeah. is now something that athletes can come back in short periods of time, right? If we look at ACL injuries, 20, 30 years ago, career ender, made, career ender. And now we just look, yeah. you know, maybe six, seven years ago now, but you know, Adrian Peterson came back in I think seven or eight months and then had the best season of his career. Right. So it's incredible. It is. It's really cool. Cause again, I've, I've kind of gone through in my career in the media, going through that transition of when, you know, athletes get hurt and you, you have kind of a standard of like, cause for us, you know, if I'm working in the media and I'm reporting on the news the day or whatever's happening and you're like, okay, this person got this injury, this takes that long to recover. We won't see them for a while. And that, that keeps changing. That keeps shifting. And it's like, wow, okay. an ACL, he's back in eight months. Like, this is crazy. You know, it is a, it is an amazing field to really dive into. One thing I want to ask you about was the diet question. You have, you were kind of saying earlier that everything has to be kind of for the individual because everybody's built so differently, I would imagine. Um, well, I, I know people are built differently, but clearly like different things work for different people in different ways. A lot of athletes are going on plant-based diets and saying Tom Brady's one of them and saying like that is important for inflammation and, you know, other reasons. And they're finding success with that. Others are like, I need to, I need to get my animal protein. That's the way that I build bulk and I do whatever. 
is that again one of those situations where it kind of varies from person to person or are there best practices in diet that you can say these are the principles you have to kind of apply to uh well i think the concept of the general principle of limiting inflammation is an important one that people should consistently consider uh general general diets that limit inflammation whether that's plant-based or otherwise have certainly proven in, in helping kind of limit the potential of limit the potential of injuries sustaining themselves so it's it helps in recovery essentially if we are having diets or we're or we're uh, on diets that limit inflammation but with regards to best practices those are ultimately going to be very specific to the individual yeah yeah and it's tough to know what your individual body needs i'm sure some of it has to be trial for most of us it has to be a little bit of trial and error and, and really noting how you feel after you eat certain things and fi figure out your own food sensitivities and probably is a process it takes some time we'll shift a little bit here concussions okay concussions w seem to be all we were talking about for about a five to seven year period uh it feels like some of that momentum has been lost i don't know if that's just my anecdotal beliefs or if that's actually happening out there do you still think this is the number one health issue facing youth and professional sports or have we started to make enough progress and process changes that that you know better brain health is a little bit more in control now where are we where do we stand on that what what processes have we done that have limited yeah, great question no you're right you're <laughs> right it, it, and it, maybe it's just me like it just seems like we're not talking about it as much and I guess when I'm thinking process, I'm thinking like, okay, so the NFL has independent uh, third-party verifiers on the sidelines. And uh, again, not solving the problem, but maybe trying to do something about it. I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't think we're, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be at all. I don't think, I think we've only scratched the surface on, on brain injury. And I'll tell you scientifically, we still don't have a full grasp of it. Uh, we have a pretty decent grasp of it. We have a better understanding than we did 20, 30 years ago, but we, it's still something that's still being studied. But I think we know enough to inform decision making and those, and I don't know if the, we've necessarily taken as a society the, uh, the best approach to addressing uh addressing the issues at hand so and what i mean by that is this right so we know that brain injury and, and concussions well let's focus on concussions concussions are also referred to as a mild traumatic brain injury right so there's yeah. mild brain injuries there's moderate there's severe uh what have you so concussions and mild traumatic brain injuries are especially interesting medically because we don't have the best technology to actually analyze them so what i mean by that is if somebody has a severe brain injury they have let's say a brain bleed we can see that on a radiological image right we can put them through some sort of cat scan or what have you or some sort of some, some sort of radio radiology to determine and clearly see in their brain that they have a severe brain injury with concussions we can't necessarily see that so a lot of the times they're diagnosed from symptoms I feel a headache, I feel dizzy, yeah. I can't see well, I have these long-term issues. And then from that, we we diagnose concussions, right? Whereas, so, so think of the problem with that, right? Let's say we have a high school football player and, or a, 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 you know, a high school soccer, soccer player, and they yeah. have some sort of event that they feel woozy, but they also have this pressure by their team and through themselves personally that they feel that they need to excel and they need to win this game and they need to get the college scholarship or whatever it is so they don't report it so they don't report i feel woozy they don't report that they feel they see blurred vision or that they have these issues because they know that if they say that they may be pulled out of the game so now how do we know how do we right. know that they even sustain a concussion, right? So we don't, right? So we have to better analyze athletes in real time is my personal thought on it, right? So if you think of, um, you know, a lot of people are wearing Fitbits or Apple Watches these days, and the concept of that is that it has something called an accelerometer. And an accelerometer basically measures acceleration. So from the acceleration of the movement of the body, we can say, 
how many steps we've taken, right? I took one step, two step, three steps, four steps, five steps based upon the acceleration that my watch is capturing, right? So, and we have these algorithms to capture how many steps we're taking. Well, brain injury is associated with high rates of acceleration too, right? So if we are able to capture acceleration, let's say if we capture accelerations within the helmet, then we'll have a better yeah. understanding as to the potential for brain injury to our youth and to younger athletes, right? So we'll have a better understanding of the real-time potential of brain injury. So I don't think that we're doing enough with the amount of technology that we have to actually analyze and determine and really watch brain injury closely. I think we're, you know, frankly, I think we're taking a very half-hearted approach. Yeah. Well, how do we change that? Like, what do we do? I mean, how do we get somebody to put more money into research or somebody like, how do we make that a front? Cause if, if it seems to me like this was front and center for a long time, and if we didn't get there during that period, and in some ways it feels like there's some momentum loss, how do we get that back? What do we do? Uh, just like we did before we highlight the problem. We highlight, you know, what, what pushed it five, 10 years ago was that there was, a lot of concussions. There's still a lot of concussions, but they've changed some of the rules in football. But how many rules have we really seen change in lacrosse or or soccer? I, you know, in soccer, I think what they've done is that they certain youth groups are suggesting that below a certain age we yeah. limit headers. Um, that's not enough, right? We know that right. brain injury can be caused not just from headers; it can be caused from just vigorous shaking of the head. So we have to we have to put pressure on it again. We have to highlight what's happening we have to highlight you know sometimes in society we have to highlight problems to for people to open their eyes uh and i think we have to do that again I, we we get too you know and now we're getting into my philosophies on life and, and society. go that's fine i love that <laughs> but, but generally speaking you know this is this is how life works right it's very cyclical a problem arises you know, there's a lot of social media and social pressure on, on, on the problem. And then, and then the next thing comes about, right? Yep. And then everybody forgets about the first one. And then we move on and we act like the first one was, was dealt with, but it hasn't been. And I think right. concussions, that's exactly what's happening is that we just kind of, kind of forgot about it. What I will say is good, however, is that, um, you know, if we think of it as a global, a bigger global picture of mental health and that brain injury is just one of the contributing factors to negatively impacting mental health, I do think that mental health is is still at the forefront and it's still a thought that is that people are considering. And I think that we have certain athletes, uh, Naomi Osaka, um yep. Simone, Simone Biles uh, yeah. uh are really are really you know using their platform and maybe they're doing it uh and they're trying to do that intentionally or unintentionally but they're using their platform and they're gaining awareness on mental mental health as, as a whole now with regards to brain injury I would hope that the societies that that govern these sports and other athletes will also use their platforms to highlight the need for for further understanding of of brain injury as well. It is fascinating the discussion on mental health. Uh, we we've started to see more athletes, and you were saying earlier, as a youth, a lot of times you don't want to feel like you're quote unquote letting down your team, so you push through some pain or some some symptoms that you're having. And it's nice that some professional athletes, a lot actually, more than I've seen in my career to, to date, have started to come forward and be honest about that and be vulnerable about that, about that and have these discussions. Simone Biles just today, on the day that we're recording this, Simone Biles pulls out of the team uh, gymnastics due to mental fatigue. And, and Naomi Osaka, as you mentioned, and Kevin Love has come out and talked about it. And DeMar DeRozan and others have said, I battle depression. This is not easy. The pressure is hard. And it's nice that we can get to that point and you hope that that transparency and that vulnerability can lead to other awareness in other areas too. And, and to your point, you know, just linking those things to concussion and to brain injuries as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think 
you, you know, these athletes are amazing. The ones that you mentioned, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, and they're obviously all going to go down in history. If people say Simone Biles is the best gymnast ever, and she probably is, right? But she may go down in history more for for yeah. actually shedding light on this topic that is that is in a pu- pandemic, right? We have the pandemic that's the coronavirus, but we also have another pandemic, which is mental health yeah. and the effect of mental health. You know, this is honestly a topic that, you know, it's probably obvious I'm very passionate about. Um, one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about it is because I always think of, I always think of, uh, you know, my, my nephew, right? <laughs> my, so I, my nephew is, you know, is three years old, four years old. And uh, I have like, if I have a cut on my finger, he says, you know, Uncle Owie, right? He sees a little yeah. cut on my finger and he he's worried now because now I have a little cut on my finger. It's very obvious to him just from a little cut that I may be in pain, right? But people who have mental health issues, it is not obvious. There's no indication that they are struggling. Um, and I think to some extent, a lot of us struggle with some sort of depression or anxiety or stress or what have you. And if we take it into the sports arena when we're talking about uh, concussions, some of these athletes may be really struggling uh, mentally, long term, short term, but there's no clear indication when we look at them that they may actually have struggles. And we all have, may have struggles, but it's we don't have that band aid. We don't have that visual uh, that visual indicator that there's a problem. So some people may may kind of push it to the side, right? But if somebody's if everybody's walking around with a broken leg or a bunch of people are walking around with a broken leg and on crutches, then now it's a, now it's an issue. Right. Yep. So anyway. it's so well said, I'm so glad that you stepped out there and said, it. I think it's so important that we realize and analyze and say, like, you can have some pride in the people that aren't just saying like, I got to just go out there every day and do it because that's what I'm paid to do, or that's what the fans expect. And to sit back and say, no, I'm not okay. I think is is pretty cool that they're they're there and i hope that we do continue to celebrate them for that you started to bring it up a little bit in there too as we talked about the pandemic i want to pivot a little bit vaccines seem to be something we're talking about constantly nowadays rightly so i hope that everybody is out there getting vaccinated but i've heard a lot of athletes say i'm worried it's going to affect my performance to me that is nuts to, what is it? What is it to you? Because you're you're the actual expert in this. Like, <laughs> is, is there any comment? I think I hear that, and I'm like, you're insane. Just go get a vaccine vaccinated. But that's my own soapbox. What's the truth in this story? The truth is obvious, right? I think <laughs> I think the truth is what we're thinking. If you it, there's no research, there's no science to say that the vaccine effect negatively impacts performance. Zero. At least that I'm aware of, and I've I've researched it, I've looked at it, I've I've tried to understand it for myself, and also obviously, you know, people ask me this question, so I want to be prepared when I answer it. And there's nothing that would suggest that getting vaccinated negatively impacts performance. However, there is a lot of research that says that if you get COVID, that negatively affects your performance, and not only affects it short term, but it may affect it long term, right? So, it's you know, I hope people get vaccinated. <laughs> it's a pretty clear choice. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's like one thing is clear as day. Yeah, it's so going pretty, to affect you in a negative yeah. way. And the other one is like, I don't know. I don't know why we're even still having to discuss it, but I'm glad to just put it out there from somebody with two doctors next to their name, rather than PhDs next to their name, rather than me. Because <laughs> I think you have a lot more authority and credibility than I do, but I'm glad to have the conversation on it. Dr. Rami Ashish, thank you so much for joining me on the show. This has been such a fascinating conversation, and uh, I just really appreciate having it with you. It's been fun. Thank you so much for having me. 